actually gives us a time that this second beast will come up. Revelation 13.10 says, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So during the dark ages when there was much persecution and the saints were being killed left and right for their faith, God was giving them encouragement and saying, Here is the patience. Wait, and this beast will be taken out. And verse 10, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity is reference here to that statement we just looked at that said that Berthier would go in and take the Pope out of office. Remember that? And so here that one that led into captivity is now led into captivity himself. And so we know that that happened in the year 1798. The next verse that we read, Revelation 13, 11, he says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And so this beast is described as coming up. And so we would ask the question, what country or what kingdom would be coming up around the year 1798? Now persecution was still going on in the 1600s. And it was during that time, this is uh, from a book called History of New England, the author says, hunted, persecuted, and imprisoned, they could discern in the future no promise of better days. Talking about Christians who were trying to worship by the dictates of their own heart. So they could discern in the future no promise of better days, and many yielded to the conviction that for such as would serve God according to the dictates of their conscience, England was ceasing forever to be a habitable place. And so word began to travel that new land was discovered. And they began to think, wouldn't it be better if we could find that land and worship with freedom to find a religion without a pope and a kingdom without a king? And so 1620, we had the Puritans coming over and the pilgrims, and they were excited to find a land where they could worship according to the dictates of their own heart. And it wasn't long until this land began to have more and more and more people coming to find that freedom. And uh, that freedom was bought with a price as the, the war against England was fought. The Declaration was signed in 1776, the Declaration of Independence. And it wasn't long after that that the Constitution was formed in 1789. And so it could be very well said that this country, the United States, was coming up, if you will, during the time of, of 1798. Not yet in full power, but rising to that that uh, fulfillment. Number two, it arose in the right place. We notice that the first beast was described as coming up out of the water. Revelation 17 and verse 15 tells us that the waters which you saw where the harlot sits, and the harlot is sitting on the beast by the way, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so that first beast described as coming up out of the water is coming up out of a very populated area. And so as we look at the second beast now, it says that it is coming up out of the earth. What do you think the earth represents here? United States, but would it, would it be a populated area or would it be an unpopulated area? Unpopulated, yeah, because it's the earth rather than the water. If the waters represent a densely populated area, then the earth would represent a sparsely populated land. Clue number three, it is depicted as a new political power. In, in uh, Bible prophecy, when animals are represented as kingdoms, most of the time you find that animal being a fully grown animal, don't you? Here's a, a slide of the goat that we find in Daniel 8.21. In Revelation you have the dragon, you have the bear, you have the leopard in Daniel. But these are all full grown animals, but what is a lamb? What is a lamb? Is a lamb a full-grown animal? No. It's a baby sheep. And so here we're given a major clue that it had horns like a lamb. It's just starting out. It's a very new country. But we know that the prophecy changes that it doesn't stay as a lamb, does it? And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So that lamb does change, that characteristic does not stick around. Clue number four, it is a democracy. How do we find that? 
Well, the first beast is described as having ten horns, and on those are ten, yeah, ten horns, and on those horns, ten crowns. Is there a crown on the second beast that comes up in Revelation 13? No, no, no crown. And so, what would you think a crown would represent in in this prophecy? A king? Yeah, a monarchy. Since a crown is the fitting symbol of a monarchy, the notable absence of crowns, in this case, clearly indicates a democratic government vesting its power in the hands of the people, not in any ruling king. And some commentators believe that the two horns then would represent civil freedom and religious liberty, or a separation, if you will, between church and state. Clue number five, it is a power of worldwide influence. Now where do we get that? Revelation 13, 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. Now how does a nation speak? Well, a nation speaks through its legislation, through its laws, and through its military power that enables it to enforce those laws. And so even though this nation begins to come up as a lamb, this prophecy tells us that it begins to speak as a dragon. And how much of the world does it cause to worship? And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this nation that's described as coming up starts out as a characteristic of, of a lamb, speaks as a dragon, and it has the power to compel the whole world, the earth, to listen to it. What, what other nation, what other kingdom in this world could we consider a superpower other than the United States of America? None that I can think of. So, just in review, just very quickly, the second beast represents a kingdom or power. It comes out of the earth, which we said is a sparsely populated area. It arises around 1798 when that first beast receives its deadly wound. It had two horns, representing separation of church and state, no crown. This is not a, a kingdom with a king, it's not a monarchy. It is lamb-like or a Christian kingdom as it starts out. It cooperates with the first beast that received the deadly wound. Clue number six, it changes characteristics from a lamb to a dragon. We've already talked about that a little bit. But the Declaration of Independence tells us that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, is that a good statement or not? That's a, that's a wonderful statement. That promises us liberty, right? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Another statement is so important to the freedoms that we hold as Americans. But this prophecy tells us that those things are going to change. Is this a godlike characteristic? Just as the prophecy said, it would start out like a lamb, representing Christ-like uh, characteristics. Yeah, God respects human freedom. The very fact that Satan was created is evidence of that. If you consider that God knows the end from the beginning, God already knew before He created Satan what the outcome would be, and that because of Satan's freedom of choice that he would rebel against God, He knew that ahead of time, didn't He? So the very fact that He still created him is evidence of the character of the God that we serve. He could have not created Satan, and who would have known? Do any of the angels know the end from the beginning? No. And so God could have chosen not to create Satan and, and the world would have not even known that He hadn't created him. But the very fact that He did tells us that God's nature is such that He gives all free choice and that He did not even practice selective creation knowing that Satan would, would rebel. He still created him. To me, that is such a, uh, evidence of what kind of character the God we serve has. Of course, that freedom of choice was given to Adam and Eve as well, and it passes down to us, and it's littered all through the Scriptures where God tells us to make a choice. He wants our response to Him to be a loving response, an obedience that is inspired by the fact that He first loved us. Joshua 24, 13, He says, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. You don't, you don't find God forcing a choice or demanding a choice. 
You, you find Him inviting you. Revelation 22, 17.